Hello everyone, how are you doing today? I hope you had a great Christmas. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the clip text include in Comfy UI. We'll talk about what the clip bot does and what is the conditioning that we are outputting from that clip text include node. And I will show you in the back end what exactly is happening. This is in hope of helping you understand the positive and negative text so that you can do a better prompt engineering. So traditionally, the prompt engineering was all about long descriptive text, which was separated into different sections. We had subject, the background, the quality, the camera angle. However, with all the improvements that happened during the year, the models are way better now. Going into 2024, the prompt engineering changed and we can get good results with just one or two words. As long as we understand what happens inside the clip text include node. So here I am inside of Comfy UI on a blank canvas. I'm going to click on the load default button. Click on OK. And this will load a default workflow within Comfy UI. In today's video, I'm going to be focusing on the clip text encode and will help you understand what this clip is doing and what this condition that we are getting from it, what is happening behind the scene in the back end, so that you have a better understanding of how to do prompts as well as how you can use a different combination of conditioning that we have. So if I take conditioning and drag out, we can see that the conditioning can go into conditioning average, conditioning combined, as well as conditioning contact. By understanding the clip text include in the back end, you will be able to determine which one of these three will give you the best results and when to use these nodes. Now, in order to follow along, go into your file explorer where you have Comfy UI portable folder. Inside it, you will have the Comfy UI folder. Go into it and then look for the nodes.py file. This Python file contains all the basic nodes which come by default with Comfy UI. Open the file using a text editor or in my case, I'm going to be using Visual Code, which is a code editor. Once the file has opened, scroll a little bit down where you see class, clip, text, encode. And then inside the class, we are going to have a method called encode. Now, just before this return statement, put your cursor, press enter, and then type in breakpoint. Since it is a function, we are going to put the parentheses round brackets after breakpoint. You can press Ctrl S to save the file or click on file, save, minimize the file and go back into Comfy UI web interface. Next, I'm going to click on the Q prop. Now, as usual, Comfy UI will load the checkpoint. And then once the checkpoint has loaded and is in memory, it will move to the clip text encode, which is next in line. Now, because we've added the breakpoint, we are going to see that the execution will stop or will pause at the clip text encode node and it will not move from there. If I go into the terminal, at the bottom, I will see Python debugger. EDB stands for Python debugger. And this allows us to type in Python code. For example, I can do one plus one, it will return two. But I can also examine the different variables which are currently in memory being used by Comfy UI. Going back to the file, since we are at the clip text encode right now, the breakpoint is here. This means that everything that is above the breakpoint line, all of this here was executed and what is below it has not executed yet. So right now in the terminal, I have access to tokens, to condition, as well as pulled. And since we are passing the clip and the text, the clip here and the text from here, I also have access to the clip here and the text from here. So as long as you know the variable name, you can simply type in the variable name. In this case, I am typing text, which we are getting from the Comfy UI text field. And in the Python debugger, I will type the exact name, text in the same 
lowercase. If it was uppercase or one letter was uppercase, I would type it the exactly the same way. Right now I'm typing text, press enter, and I get back the text that was inside of Comfy UI. Now, similarly, the method encode is taking clip, and this clip is coming from our load checkpoint model, where we are passing this clip here over here, right? So in the terminal, we have access to the clip variable. If I type in clip, press enter, it's going to tell me that it is a comfy UI clip object, and we have the memory address. Now in Python, we can inspect a particular object and find out what we can do with that object by doing dir and then parenthesis inside it, we pass in the object. So dir, open the round bracket, put in clip, close the round bracket and press enter. It will return a list of all the method and function available in clip. In this case, what we are interested in is the clip layer as well as the encode. So clip layer, if you're coming from automatic 1111 background, you may have seen the field clip layer minus one or minus two over there. In Comfy one we can take the clip, drag out and select clip set last layer as the checkpoint. And this will be similar to automatic 1111 clip layer, which was minus one, minus two. And then the output of this clip we can pass it to the clip text encode like this. So in this diagram, we can see what happens when we set up a clip layer or the last clip layer. Now in a deep learning model, we usually have inputs. These inputs get passed to a layer and then usually they are all hidden layers. And finally we get an output. When we are setting up and changing the last clip to be minus one, we are telling that we want to go from input to the first layer. And then from this layer itself, we skip this and go directly into the output. And sometimes this can give better result compared to going through all the layers. Now to understand whether to use a clip layer of minus one or minus two, you will have to try out and see if the final output is better or not. For now, I'm going to remove it and continue on with the clip text encode. I will quit out of the terminal by pressing Q, enter, go into the web interface, close out of that error message, and then I will change my prompt to something that is simple. I will say moon, click on the Q prompt, go back into the terminal, and then I can look into my text, which says moon, good. In the code now, we can see that once we have the text, it goes and it gets tokenized using the click dot tokenized. So if we look at tokens, which is this variable here, right? So I'm typing the exact same word with the S, press enter. This will return a dictionary. Now in Python, we can check what we can do with the dictionary by simply doing tokens dot keys. This will give me the keys to the dictionary. In this case, we only have one, which is L, and we have this L here. So I can do tokens, and then I access the key. In this case, L, press enter, I will get out a list. So if I copy everything here and go into my code editor, create a new file, I will change the language to Python. Then I will create a dummy variable called it tokens and paste the code I got previously. I've just formatted the code so that we can visualize it better. So at the top, we have a list. Inside the list, we have another list. And in this second list, we have these tuples. We go all the way down. We can see that the list ends here. I'm going to remove some of the tuples so that we can see everything on one screen. So let's try to understand what this tokens is giving us. So the top one is just a variable name. Then we've seen in the terminal that it's actually a dictionary with a key of L. When we access the L, we get this list here. So we have an outer list. This outer list has only one element in it. And inside the second list, we have tuples, which has a number here and another number 1.0. So the first number 
is the token. The second number is the weight associated with that token. By default, all the words that we have in the text has a default weight of 1.0. So if I were to type moon and then I would say blue, both blue and moon would have a default weight of 1.0. So there's no need for us to add any of the weight. We can simply just say moon and blue. Now going back to my temporary token file, the first value that we have, this number here, it's for a start token. This is how internally we know that we are starting the token, the clip start token. Then we are going to have tuple that will correspond to the text. In our case, since I initially put moon as my only text, it's getting tokenized with the number 3293 with a weight of 1.0. Then the last number is the stop token. So we are always starting with a start token. In the middle, we have our tokenized text. And then at the end, we need to tell where we are stopping. So we have a stop token. And we can see the number 49406 and then 49407. If we go into the terminal, we have the exact same thing. So we start 49406. In the middle, we have our text, which was tokenized. And then we have the stop token right away. Now, you may have noticed that the stop token keeps on repeating itself and goes and goes and goes on. So in Python, in order to check the number of items that we have in a list, we can do length. So L-E-N stands for length. And then open the parentheses, put in what we want to check. So in this case, we want to check tokens. We are accessing the L keyword. And I want to get the length of the inner list. The inner list can be accessed by doing square brackets, zero. I need to close the length function, press enter, and I get 77 items inside the list. Now, just to prove that the outer list has only one element, I'm going to remove the zero, press enter, and you can see we have one. So the outer list has one element, which is an inner list, and this inner list has 77 tuples inside it, which stands for the tokens. And the reason as to why this stop token keeps on going, that is to pad the list so that we have the total item of 77 at once. When we pass the token into the condition, the condition expect the format to be in a batch of 77 elements. So let's exit out of the terminal by pressing Q and then enter, go into the web UI, click on close, and I'm going to type in a really long text box. So I'm going to go into a web browser, type in Loram Ipsum. You can choose any website and just copy these texts. Go into ConfUI, paste the text, make sure to paste it maybe two times or three times, and then click on QPro. Go back into terminal, click do tokens again. And this time we can see that the tokens is larger in size. If we do the length of the tokens accessing the L keyword, we can see now we have an outer list containing six element and each inner element has 77 tokens in it. So right now, when I'm doing zero, I'm accessing the first element in that inner list. Then if I do one, I'm accessing the second element. Pressing enter, I can see the first one as well as the second element. They each has 77 tokens inside their list. So now we know that when we are conditioning the text, the text need to be in a batch of 77 tokens. So if you have a really long text like this, your text may get cut in the middle and then you get one section as 77 tokens, get passed over to the condition and then the remaining part get passed as a separate section. So going back to the slide here, where we have long descriptive text, this is not always good because if the model was trained on simple text, 
for a default of 77 tokens and you are passing a total of 462. So we have 77 multiplied by 6. In this particular case, the model may not be able to follow the prompt as accurately as possible. So always check back if the model during training, if they were using long descriptive text, then you want your prompt to also reflect those long descriptive text. But in case the model was trained with short text, you want to stick to short text in order to get the best results. I'm going to exit out of the terminal once again, pressing Q, enter, close out the error message. By the way, the error message is because we have not completed the workflow. When we are doing QProp, it goes from low checkpoint to clip text encode for the positive, and then it goes to the negative. It loads an empty latent, which goes into the key sampler. And then we have the VAD code and the save image. When we've done a breakpoint at this point, at the clip text encode node, it goes from load checkpoint to the clip text encode. It hits the breakpoint and Q stands for quit at this stage. So we are quitting here and we did not do any of these at the bottom. That is why we are getting an error message every time we quit the terminal. Okay, so now that we know what is a token, how it's getting tokenized, what is the ideal batch count, let's move on to understanding conditioning. I'm going to revert back to the default prompt that comes with Pump UI, and I still have a breakpoint in the code file. I will click on Q prompt. This will stop me at the breaking point. And we can check the text the same. We have the tokens. In this case, we have 77 as the token count, but we also have access to condition. C-O-N-D in the code it stands for condition. And we press enter, we get back a tensor. Now in deep learning, we have a set of inputs. In the stable diffusion case, we have text and images. The text goes through the clip it gets converted into numbers. These numbers are what we call tokens. And then the numbers get normalized into what's called as a tensor. This tensor is in this format. So at the top, we have the text moon. It goes through the clip text encoder. We get back condition, which is of type tensor. The tensor is simply a three-dimensional representation of the data. So we we have the text data. We are representing it in a numerical format in a three-dimensional shape. So we have one set of square brackets, then a second one, then a third one here. That's why we call it three-dimensional because we have three sets of brackets. Now, this tensor is just a number and this number has a certain number of decimal places and these decimal places are determined based on the training data. So by default, when we are training, we use torch.load, which stands for load 32. This means that the precision is 32 decimal places. Now in the terminal, when we do condition and we get back the tensor, there is a decimal place limit that can be outputted, which is why we are just getting four decimal places here. But we can check the type by doing condition D type, press enter, and it will tell us what is the precision level. In this case, we have torch.load32. This means that the text that we have at the top here, which got tokenized here, got passed to become a condition and return a tensor as now a 32 floating point precision. The more this number is, the higher the information that we are going to retain in code. And the less the number, the more data we are going to lose in code. Now, 32 is the default. Now that we have an understanding of what condition is inside the code, it's just a bunch of numbers, we can understand what is happening when we take the condition, we pull out, and let's say we are doing a conditioning concatenate. So when we have a clip text encode, we duplicate it. We take the first clip text encode condition, goes into a conditioning contact. We take the second one, we put it in the conditioning from, 
and then it outputs a conditioning which we can take and pass it over to the case sampler. So all we are doing is we are taking a bunch of numbers in this first condition. We are going to add to this bunch of numbers and the final result will be number plus number and you get another condition which is just a simple addition between the two. Similarly, we can remove this. We can take the conditioning out, can do a conditioning average, conditioning combine, and we've already seen the conditioning contract. So we can do all of that and you can guess what is happening. Averaging, we just take the number with averaging. Combine, we're just combining the number. Concatenating, we're just joining the two conditions together. Of course, if we go in code, we can see conditioning combined here. We're just taking conditioning one plus conditioning two. If we go into the averaging, we are doing all of this, basically just averaging it. And then in the conditioning concat, we're just joining it together, right? So we're doing torch.concatenate and we take the first condition with the second condition, append it together. So now we know that the clip text in good takes the text in the string format, tokenize it, outputs a condition, which is just a tensor made up of numbers, and then pass that over to the key sampler. So now I'm going to exit out of the terminal and I will quit this session by pressing Control C and then choosing Y or yes, press enter. This will close out the Comfy UI session. I will go back into the code, look for where I've entered breakpoint and remove that line. Control S to save, or you can go to file and click on save. We can close out of the nodes.py Python file. We are not going to need it. And then run Comfy UI again. Once it's loaded, I'm going to clear the canvas, click on load default. I'm going to choose a model. In my case, it's going to be Anniverse. I'm going to write a very basic positive prompt. You can copy it if you want to follow along. A negative prompt. The empty latent is going to be default. The key sampler, I'm going to fix the C to number one for reproducibility. I will choose 20 steps, a high CMG of seven. I will choose Euler Ancestral as the sampler. It is relatively fast. Scheduler will be normal. And then I'm going to click on QProm. So I've copied the output here just so that we can compare it. This is the result. I have a one girl. I have a white beach hat, blonde and green eyes. And all four of these elements are present. We have the girl or the 26 year old lady. Then we have the white beach hat. We also have the blonde hair and green eyes. So this is an example of a good model which can follow prompt as accurately as possible. And since this model was trained with Dan Buru's tags, I'm passing individual tags separated by comma. I'm not saying a 26 year old lady wearing a white beach hat with blonde hair and green eyes. I'm not writing a full sentence. I'm just passing in tags separated by commas. And we got a pretty good result accurate to our text spot. Now this time I'm going to change my checkpoint to the base SD 1.5 model, leave everything as is and click on QPROM. So this is the result I got. I have a lady, I have the blonde hair. We can sort of argue that this is green, okay? It's, it's mostly gray to my eyes, but the main difference here is that the hat is also green. It's not white like we specified at the top. So this time I'm going to change the prompt into a sentence or a phrase. 26 year old lady wearing a white hat with blonde hair and green eyes. And this is the result. So same issue. We are not able to get the white hat. We are having a bleeding of colors. The green eyes is influencing what we have in front, the white hat. And even if I change the order of the text, so in this case, I have green eyes at the beginning and wearing the white hat at the end, the result is still the same. I'm not able to get the white hat. Now, at this point, you would try to do some kind of ink painting to try to get the white hat. But since today's video is about clip text and glue, let's see how we can fix this issue. So this time I'm going to try to break down the text into two separate sections. This section is going to have the one girl, 26 year old lady, white beach hat, 
blonde and green eyes. And then I have a top section, which is going to have just white beach hair. And then I'm going to pass this over to a conditioning contact. The order does not matter. And the resulting conditioning, I will pass that to a K sampler. So since we know what is happening behind the scene, we know that we are going to get a tensor from this first conditioning. This tensor will go over here. And then this one will also output a tensor, but just for white beach hat. So I'm going to put an emphasis on the white beach hat. The tensor will get passed to the conditioning concat, and we are going to get a resulting conditioning, which get passed over to the positive. And here's the result. We are able to influence the image to go towards the white. Although this is not perfect just yet, but it's a good starting point. Also note that the bleeding of the color green, which was happening here in this image, you can see the background is really green. And this conditioning concat, we were able to eliminate that bleeding to have a clear, neutral background. Next, I'm going to do the conditioning average. So exactly same logic. I'm going to take a first positive form, which goes over to the conditioning average. And then we have a second click text angle, which contains only the item of interest, in this case, white beach hat, goes over to conditioning average. And then the output goes into the positive prop of the case sampler. And this is the result. Now we can clearly see that we are moving towards the white and we've also eliminated the background interference that was happening with the green bleeding. I'm also going to try with the conditioning combine exactly the same thing. And the result is like this. So all three here, we have the conditioning concat, the conditioning average, as well as the conditioning combine. And if we compare this with the original case where we are not using any of the conditioning contact averaging combined, we see a lot of the bleeding of colors that were happening. Now, although these methods are not perfect, they give us a better result. So if you find yourself in a case where you have different elements with different colors and the colors are blending into the background or the subject, then you can try to isolate section of your prompt into different clip text encode, pass it over to one of the method here, either the concat, average, or combined, and see if you have a better result. Now, ideally, you want to have this type of result where your model is able to follow the prompt as accurate as possible, but not all models will be fine-tuned to the point that they end follow the prompt accurately. In the case of the Aniverse model, this model is well trained to output characters, but the moment I change the text prompt to a car or a ball, the model does not know what car or ball means. It will just output a random character out there. However, in the case of SD 1.5, it knows what ball or car means, so we can generate images of a variety of objects. So in conclusion, trying to go for a long descriptive text is not always good. As we've seen, internally, the text will get split into 77 tokens and each batch will get passed over to a condition. So you need to check with how the model was trained in order to find whether short props or long descriptive props will work best for that particular model. Second, we've also seen how the conditioning is working, the tensor that is in the back end and since they are a bunch of numbers, we can do mathematical calculation with it. And in this case, we have the conditioning concat, conditioning combine, as well as the conditioning average, three different nodes to do mathematical operation. And this can give us a better result. So with that, I think it's a good stopping point. Thank you for watching. This was a little bit technical, but I hope you found this interesting and was able to understand a little bit about how the backend works. With that, thank you for watching until the very end. I will see you in the next one.